because our educational system is built on on two on two things one memorization and the second recitation so if 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 you go to any level of school and you memorize something and then you can recite it in an examination they'll give you a degree and that's it that's the end of the responsibility nobody has taught us about the conscience nobody has ever taught me i never even heard of uh, four functions of the mind what, what what's that but that's what it is there are four functions of the mind conscience is one of them and it's the only one that can decide and it's the only one that can reflect super conscious wisdom all right everybody welcome to the mental purpose podcast do this with me real quick Take a deep breath. This one's deep. This one's real deep. My guest today is Leonard Perlmutter. He, the, the, the conversation we had, it, it's truly extraordinary and it's, it is real deep, but it's super effective as well. So you guys are going to get so much out of this conversation. Before I jump into Leonard's extremely large bio, uh, let me go over the resources that you have through us, through the Mental Purpose Organization. So you've got obviously this podcast you're listening to every week. We're going to start doubling these episodes every week. We've got a lot of people asking for more content, which is awesome. The other free resource we have is the Mental Purpose Community. If you have not joined the Mental Purpose Community on Facebook, you must. It is filling up quick. It is awesome. We'll never get, we'll never, we'll never be out. So you have plenty of, of space in there, no problem. But the content is increasing. There's free videos. There's a, just an ecosystem of people that are like-minded and actually doing the work. Unlike some other places where maybe they're just kind of pretending like they are, or they're information addicts just looking to, to, to just compile more and eat more. We're actually digesting and using it and changing our lives and living the mission of men on purpose in this community, which is to elevate, educate, empower, enrich, and evolve men to be on purpose to help them reveal their most authentic self and to live the most fulfilling and regret-free life possible. That's my mission, that's the mission of Mental Purpose, that's Aaron's mission, that's Meredith's mission, my wife. That is our goal in life, is to help you and ourselves achieve those things. We can achieve those things, you can have a damn good life, and you literally will have anything you want. Money, success, relationships, clarity, whatever you want, you got it. So, let's get into the guest today, and this one's gonna be deep. So you're going to want to write down a lot of stuff because we're going to be talking about conscience. Conscience. Say it again. We're going to be talking about the conscience, literally, and everything around it. And I'm, I'm telling you, I was learning stuff. I'm writing like a, a frenzy because the guy has these concepts that are so simple to understand. But because of how we've been programmed by school and society and government and you know jobs and all that stuff, Sometimes it's, it seems out of reach, but the way that Leonard puts it, it puts it right within your grasp and it's beautiful. And I was intrigued. I was so curious. It was awesome. So let me tell you about Leonard. So Leonard is one of the Western world's pioneers in the introduction of meditation into the cultural, cultural firmament. Having founded the American Meditation Institute, AMI, in New York in 1996. AMI's courses are now approved and accredited by the American Medical Association and the American Nurses Association. And Leonard also serves as an author and editor of Transformation, the Journal of Meditation as Mind-Body Medicine. So you're, you're dealing with a very, very, very big source here. Leonard's first book, The Heart and Science of Yoga, the American Meditation Institute's Empowering Self-Care Program for a Happy, Healthy, Joyful Life, is an encyclopedic guide to meditation and the yoga science that lies behind it. The book and its corresponding curriculum taught by Leonard in his foundations class was enthusiastically endorsed by popular medicine luminaries like Dr. Dean Ornish, Mehmet Oz, and Larry Dossi. Over the past 25 years, Leonard has served on the faculty of the New England Institute of Ayurvedic Medicine in Boston, Massachusetts, and the International Himalayan Yoga Teachers Association in Calgary. He studied uh, in India, he's a direct disciple of Swani Rama of the Himalayas, the man who, in laboratory conditions in the Manganer Institute, demonstrated that blood pressure, heart rate, and autonomic nervous system can be voluntarily controlled. That's the type of stuff we're going to be talking about today. It's mind-blowing. It really is. 
The research demonstrations have been one of the most, the major cornerstones of the mind-body movement. Leonard has uh, presented information workshops on the benefits of meditation and yoga science at the Anderson Cancer Center, Kaiser Permanente, Albany Medical College, New York Times Forum, Yoga Science, Commonwealth Club of California, University of Wisconsin, like it, the list goes on. Medical institutions, I mean, West Point, you name it, University of Colorado, you name it. The guy is a leading authority. And that's what, you know, my goal is, is to bring people that are just doing things and being things at just such a high level that when they can filter down or disseminate or percolate their information down, we don't have to worry about its tested and proven nature. We already know that it's proven. So the best part is if you want a farther faster, you're here, you're listening to a show, a program, content that will get you farther faster because this information is so high level that they're gonna give it to us where we can actually start to digest it now. You ready? Let's do it. Here we go, enjoy. All right, Leonard, thanks for joining me, man. Let's, uh, let's just jump right in. First question. What exactly, what exactly is conscience? Well, you know, uh, my experience is that even from a very young age, uh, everybody sort of feels like, uh, gosh, there seems to be different voices in my mind. And as it turns <laughs> out, that's true. Uh, so the conscience is one of these voices. Uh, and it's a very important one because it is the only function of the mind that can discriminate, determine, judge, and decide. Hmm. The conscience is the only function of the mind that can decide. Now, here's something really important. We can't do anything in the, in the world without first entertaining a thought. Uh, Ian, if I asked you to raise your hand over your head, Neither of us could raise our hand without first entertaining a thought. So the power of that tells us that the mind moves first and then the body acts. And so that means yeah. the power of thoughts is critically important. And the conscience makes those decisions of what's to be done and what's not to be done. And that means to me that Every single choice we have ever made in our lives, every single choice we will ever make in our life has been and always will be made by the conscience. So that just focused my attention. Oh my gosh, that, yeah. that's a real important yeah. function of the mind. That's the only one that decides. And the other three that we'll talk about a little in a little bit, the ego, the senses, and the unconscious mind, they can't make a decision, but they can create a lot of noise because they are the advisors, if you will, right? They're counselors. But the conscience is the only function of the mind that can make a decision. And we all know on some level that when we listen to our conscience and we let it be our guide, we feel pretty good. And when, yes, and okay. when we go against the conscience and we know we go against the conscience, gee, a lot of times it feels, I feel guilt and, and it's heavy and it's dark yeah. and it's painful. So that's the. So are we talking, are we talking about the conscience as a, as a larger being than obviously we're going to talk about that today, but what we're, what we've been told is different than what we're experiencing right now, what we're talking about, because it's a much bigger thing than, than we've led on to believe, it sounds like. And it's yeah. um, one, of the, one of the biggest reasons why I wanted to talk to you is because once I was reading your stuff, I thought, you know, there's new stuff I'm learning here. And that's interesting because I feel like I've studied so much about the brain and trauma and ego. Obviously, there's always more to learn, but the way that you have presented things was is so intriguing because the way that you're you're describing it is different than I've ever heard. Well, it's different than I ever heard. <laughs> and and because of that, <laughs> it was a game changer in my life. And it's not that yeah. I believed it right away, but I was curious enough uh, to want to practice and to experiment with it. And gosh, it made me feel better. 
physically, mentally, emotionally. I yeah. felt like I was more creative. I was making better choices. I had less pain in my life. I was attracting creative people, nurturing situations that before that, uh, I was in a whole lot of pain. Yeah. Hmm. Pain from traumas of your past, pain from present moment stuff. All, all of the of above, even the food that I was eating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So the conscious is like the higher power within you. It's almost like when people describe the mind or the, um, the gut as the second well, brain. Well, that the, the gut being the second brain is the conscience also. It's all, you know, oh, it's, okay. it's non-local, so to speak. It's not local, yeah, but it yeah. is part of the mind. It is part of the mind. But here's the, here's the critically important thing to know that when situation is ideal, when the scenario is ideal, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes, the conscience acts as a mirror. That's its functionality. It's a pass through. And it alone has the capacity to reflect perfect super conscious wisdom from the super conscious portion of the mind that lies beyond the conscious and beyond the unconscious minds. So when I, when I first uh, read that and, and, and started to assimilate it, uh, it, I was questioning, is this just poetry? Is it, a, is it a metaphor? And it turns out the super conscious portion of the mind is the same portion of the mind where Albert Einstein saw mathematical equations. And Paul McCartney yeah. uses the, uh, uh, the conscience and the super conscious wisdom reflected by it to hear beautiful melodies. Doesn't mean that we're going to become songwriters or mathematicians or physicists, but based on the unique constellation of relationships, duties and obligations that we have, we can access certain wisdom from this intuitive library of wisdom, this super conscious wisdom that will directly and positively affect every single unique relationship that we have. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, it's really well said in our coaching practice, people always ask us, is there a secret? Is there a, is there a, um, a fast forward? Is there some one thing that we could follow that would help everything? And I said, you know, there is, and there isn't, when I say there is the one thing I'm describing, and I want to ask you this question is your job is to remove the distractions that aren't real, that aren't actually in your world that are from the past coming into the present, that's your job is to differentiate between the two and know that. And you have to build yourself up to be able to really see clearly because most people run by their feelings and their traumas and this, they, they think the past is actually the present and creates the future. So what you're saying is pretty much the same thing though. The Albert Einstein quote or the, or the example or the Paul McCartney example is um, these guys have 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 molded this thing or understood it so much and removed so many distractions that this that this the gears actually meet up fully and can turn at a very high rate of production or speed or whatever it i might think be. so it's that a different word but it's i think it's the same sentiment yeah yeah yeah, yeah that's interesting i, I love that because you know look personal development for that generalization it can be very complicated and challenging for people because there's so many different things to understand. The one thing that became very challenging and overwhelming for me was, isn't there, isn't there a formula here? Can't there be a formula for, for true transformation? And there is. And one of the biggest pieces is you got to learn how to understand what's actually real in your life in the moment and what feelings are just leading you astray. So why don't people, why don't people trust or follow the contents? Why, why do they not go that Because route? our Seems educational like system world. is built on, on, two, on two things. One, memorization, and the second, recitation. So if, yeah. if, if you go to any level of school and you memorize something and then you can recite it in an examination, they'll give you a degree and that's it. That's the end of the responsibility. Nobody has taught us about the conscience. Nobody has ever taught yeah. me. I never even heard of uh, four functions of the mind. What, what, what's that? But that's what it is. 
there are four functions of the mind. Conscience is one of them, and it's the only one that can decide, and it's the only one that can reflect superconscious wisdom. But when the other functions of the mind are so noisy, the conscience cannot hear the signal from the superconscious mind. In that case, the conscience will still make the decision, but instead of making the decision based on superconscious wisdom, it will merely rubber stamp the limited, often faulty concepts of the other three functions of the mind. Wow. Wow. I love that. I love hearing okay. that. So let's right. talk about it. What so, are the four functions of the mind? Okay. <laughs> Let me write into that one. We're a good team. So. <laughs> so the first function of the mind that yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll discuss is the ego. So now the ego, uh, we, we have a very limited, naive uh, understanding of what the ego is. It's not just about uh, being puffed up and full of oneself, because the ego, in my understanding, is the ego is actually hardwired to the reptilian brain. Now, what's the reptilian brain all about? Oh, self-preservation doesn't want to die. Wants to wants to maintain the the form. Clear. So, because self-preservation is so important, vitally important to the ego and the reptilian brain, both of them are totally all in and invested in the fear of annihilation. That's why you see fear so rampant all over uh, in our culture. Mm -hmm. And yet, President Roosevelt yeah. once said something very profound. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Mm -hmm. And fear always takes one of two forms. Yeah. Either I'm afraid I might not get what I want, or I'm afraid I might lose what I have. And every fear must be examined. So the point is, the ego doesn't examine anything. The, the, the ego gets the message from the reptilian brain. And like Chicken Little, at the drop of the hat, the ego is saying, oh my gosh, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, I'm going to die, I'm going to get sick. So that's not to say that the ego is always wrong. Right now, you and I, Ian, we need a healthy ego to have this kind of conversation that we're having and make sense. Mm -hmm. We need, a, we need a, a healthy ego to drive an automobile sure. or a truck. Sure. So the ego can be helpful, but they, the ego only has a limited perspective. And with this limited expect, uh, perspective, invested in the fear of annihilation, Ego, in the midst of every relationship, cuts that relationship in half and defines part of it as pleasant, which the ego says, I like it, and I define it as good. Let's reprise this pleasantness. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, the ego says, oh, over here? This is unpleasant. Yeah. I call this bad. I'd like to eliminate it. But we already know that that which is pleasant isn't always good. And that which is unpleasant isn't always bad for us. But if my mind becomes addicted to the limited yeah. perspective of just the ego, then I'm, I'm in bondage to my likes and dislikes. Uh -huh. And that inflexibility of my mind inevitably creates an inflexibility of the consciousness of every cell of the body, which causes what? Pain. That's right. Well, when the decibel level gets louder and louder and louder, yeah. ultimately it, it morphs disease. into disease. Yeah. Before we go into the other three... I want to know how does it get, how does the conscience know? How, how, does, how does it, 
how does it inevitably know? And these are these are like um, these are big general questions, but I want to talk very specifically here. So my curiosity is how does it know how to do that? How does it get its its info? How does it how is it programmed? If it's not programmed, if we're programmed by society and you know and school and stuff like that, then how do we still have this this function inside of our bodies that really understands the way? That's the difference between a human being and every other form of animal. We are unique. We have a yeah. we have a conscience which can access super conscious wisdom. We do not have to exclusively live uh, like other animals do. Mm -hmm. So we can we can make better decisions in in real time. And it's programmed, it is programmed, it's programmed by the supreme intelligence that we euphemistically refer to as G-O-D. Yeah. yeah, I really want to go that, I want to go into that with you for a second. And I kind of don't because I feel like we're going to get, we're going to get too far deep into that. But lately in my life, I've I'm been, I've been, um, are you okay if I go there? Oh, sure. Lately in my life, I've been, thinking about God as an internal uh, being mechanism, not a higher power out there, but an internal. It's both. Yeah. It's both. It's both. Yeah. Here, here, there, and everywhere. It's the background of all reality. Yeah. That's the into which gross and subtle objects appear for limited periods of space and time with which we have a relationship. One of those gross objects is my body. Another one is my mind. Another one is your body and your mind and the chairs we're sitting in. And once we have a relationship with it, we have to take an action and every action is going to bring about a consequence. Yeah. What about heaven or hell? Or heaven and hell? Yeah, I, I experience that daily. <laughs> and that's what I want to ask you because there are so many people that will say like, you know, uh, very religious people, not that there's anything wrong with it. We're not saying anything about it. I'm just saying, I'm just giving an example. Very religious people will, will say, you know, do this, don't do this, or you'll go, you'll go to hell or you'll go to heaven, this kind of thing. And my, my, my thought process is, but there are so many people on this planet that live in constant hell. Wouldn't hell just be the, the cycle they're living in? And then when they die, to keep living that type of cycle without being able to break it? Isn't hell a now or heaven a now and a conscious choice versus a one day I'll go to this place of fiery damnation or puffy clouds and people fanning me and giving me grapes? Like this sounds ridiculous to me, but I don't want to discredit every you know major religion that believes in that. Um, and I'm not against religions at all. I just I just see people, you know, as a high level coach and coaching thousands of people around the world, our, our company, I see people in hell every hour, every hour. And they don't give a shit about their future hell. They care about the hell right now that they're living in, in here and in here. How do you differentiate the two to, to, to not bring all of those external factors and forces in that are manipulating or guiding or running your thought process and your subsequent actions. How does somebody start to tap into and, 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 and get the answers from within? First of all, my, my first reaction is every, every, uh, every word is just an attempt by one human being to communicate something to another human being. We call them concepts. We call them words. And so here's a word, hell. Now, yeah. the, uh, the religions and the culture have defined it for us. But well, we know what hell is. When my outer actions in the world conflict with my inner wisdom, when my outer actions, that's thoughts, words, and deeds, conflict with my own super conscious wisdom within me, that is me, having this human experience, when there is a conflict in my mind, that conflict in my mind becomes the mother of all problems. 
So if there's conflict in my mind with the actions that I'm taking, that inner conflict is going to project outer conflict. And when situations conflict so much, they pile up, we call that hell. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if I can eliminate the conflict between my outer actions and my inner wisdom, how? If I let my conscience be my guide and I allow this super conscious wisdom just for the sake of an experiment to become the basis of my thoughts, words, and actions, that eliminates the conflict in my mind. It eliminates the conflict between my outer action and my inner wisdom. And when there's no conflict in my mind between outer action and inner wisdom, it's impossible for there to be conflict outside the mind. Everything flows from the subtle to the gross, just as the mind has to move first before the body moves. In which case, it would be impossible, it would be impossible to experience hell. Good point. Really good point. Great explanation. I've never heard it put like that. It's a really cool explanation. What are the other functions of the mind? What are the other three? Okay, well, you got, first yep. we got the ego. Now we got the senses. Now the senses are very interesting because these are the vehicles for our creative energy to explore the world. So our mind projects and extrudes our creative energy through our eyes and our nostrils and our mouth and our ears and our hands and our feet. What for? To explore the world, constantly looking for objects and relationships that I believe might bring me happiness, might bring me security, might bring me health. Yeah. Here's the problem. Uh, the senses only view the appearance of pleasure and they don't see the back. So it's just purely Just external. the front. It's sort of like advertising, level. the advertising industry. They just sell you the front but not the back. Mm -hmm. So that becomes problematic. It becomes very problematic for us. So it's analogous to uh, squeezing a tube of toothpaste. If I squeeze, squeeze a tube of toothpaste, the toothpaste will come out, but it's virtually impossible to get the toothpaste back in the tube. So it's the same with our creative energy. If the mind is addicted, which it is, to extruding our creative energy through our eyes and nostrils and mouth and ears, hands and feet, you can't get it back. So how are we going to fulfill the purpose of our lives? How are we going to fulfill all of our duties and responsibilities without creative energy? Not. It's impossible. It's just impossible. So the, the senses, not that they're wrong all the time, because I like a good meal. I, I like a fine dessert. I have uh, a body. I have senses. Life is to be enjoyed without guilt. However, the senses, too, only have a limited perspective. And like the ego, they're often wrong, but they're never in doubt. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And so that's the senses and the ego. Then the third function of the mind is the unconscious mind. The, this is the repository for all of our merits and demerits. You know, all of our memories. Some are pleasant, some are unpleasant. And all of our imaginations, you know, these what-if situations. What if this should happen? Or what if that should happen? And what happens if neither of them happen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, this, this storage, if you will, it's like the hard drive of everything that we deem essential to self-preservation. Yeah. And again, the unconscious mind is not always wrong. There's some very positive concepts stored in the unconscious mind that can be helpful. But again, 
the unconscious mind, just like the ego and the senses, only has a limited perspective. Yeah. Whereas the conscience has a 360 degree panoramic view. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have the ego, the senses, and the unconscious mind. They're loud, they're pushy, they're insistent. Yeah. And they often vote in a block. <laughs> Power. And these are the advisors. Yeah. These are the advisors. And as I mentioned before, if the mind is not quiet, then the conscience does not have the ability to reflect superconscious wisdom from the superconscious portion of the mind. But since it's the only function of the mind that can decide, it will decide on the loudest, pushiest voice that it can hear. Hmm. So what happens? It winds up that the conscience just rubber stamps the limited, often faulty concepts of the ego senses and unconscious mind. And each time we serve faulty concepts that conflict with our inner wisdom, the decibel level of pain is increased yeah. and increased and increased. So as as a scientist, we're asked to listen to the whispers of pain, listen to the whispers of pain as good telemetry and make a mid-course correction to eliminate the conflict. Does it do anything to the, I know you had said like the, 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 the pain levels increase, but like does the conscience be, uh, become affected or is it hurt or is it, uh, does it build a habit or a, a tolerance or a, you know, whatever. All, all of the above, all of the above, all of the above. The analogy, Ian, is that, let's remember, the conscience is a mirror, right? Yeah. So when we don't use it to its full capacity, say it's up in the attic, yeah. we keep it up in the attic. Uh -huh. And then when we really want it, we bring it down, but gosh, it's filthy. <laughs> it's got all this dust and debris that has landed on it retarding retarding its reflective quality oh okay that makes sense so it's just dulling the mirror uh -huh. almost it dulls the yeah. mirror's capability right but each time i use it even with seemingly insignificant no-brainers it's like taking out a bottle of glass cleaner spraying it and cleaning 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 the mirror to increasingly and reliably reflect super conscious wisdom as opposed to just rubber stamping the loudest voice that it can hear. That's really interesting. It's, I've never, I just never thought about it like that. Uh, I've thought about the other pieces. Neither had I. So the fourth, but it's so what's the fourth, uh, what's the fourth one? The fourth is the, the fourth is the conscience. The fourth is the conscience. So, Ian, in every relationship, it's my job, it's your job to become the parent of the ego senses, unconscious mind, and the conscience. We have to be our own parent and train the ego senses and unconscious mind to support the superconscious wisdom of the conscience. And in this experiment, process we're asked not to take on too much too soon yeah. because the ego and the senses and the unconscious mind equate any change of habit as as a death that threatens their power wow mm -hmm. okay so in every situation what i do is i make an appointment with the ego senses and unconscious mind and the conscience. And I have them sit around the kitchen table. And uh, I, I play, I play uh, the moderator or the parent. And so I might say something like this to them. Look, we just finished this, uh, this dinner. And the question before all of us is, are we going to brush our teeth? Or are we not going to brush our teeth? So I'm going to call on each of you so that I can hear you, so that each one of you will be received. 
Ego, please start. What is your opinion? Should we brush our teeth or should we not brush our teeth? And what does the ego usually say? No, I don't think so. No, I'm against it. It's unpleasant. So I vote no. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Now I'll go to the senses. Senses, should we brush our teeth or should we not brush our teeth now that dinner is concluded? And the senses might say, well, you know, if I'm absolutely honest with you and I want to be honest with you, uh, right now I want to say that I enjoyed that dinner very much. But even more than the dinner, I enjoyed the dessert. You know, we had uh, apple pie tonight and that's my favorite. So, insofar as this brushing of the teeth routine, I vote no, because I'd rather have a second piece of apple pie. Got it. That's my vote for more apple pie. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Now for the unconscious mind, what, what, what's your perspective? Well, I'm with the other two. That's my habit. Yeah. I'm voting, you know, we often vote as a block. Some people call us the three amigos. So I'm with the ego and the senses. Okay, well, thank you very much. Now, if the three of you can just sit quietly, I'm going to call on the conscience now and ask the conscience in this quiet mind now to reflect super conscious wisdom and share what it has learned. And conscience, would you say something? So the conscience might get up and say, well, you know, uh, this life that we're living, this is not a sprint. This is more like a marathon. And for a marathon, we need certain things. We need strong, healthy teeth. We need strong, healthy gums. We need a strong, healthy immune system. And I'm learning from the superconscious wisdom that if we can just take a time out for two minutes and brush our teeth, that will increase the strength and the health of our teeth and our gums and our immune system. So for the sake of an experiment, I tell them as their parent, let's just do a, a, an easy experiment and go in and brush the teeth and then come back to the kitchen table and everybody will share what they experience. So we march into the... Uh, into the bathroom, we brush the teeth because it's, it's, you know, it's fairly easy. It's an experiment, right? I, I'm not locked into it. It's not a right. forever. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to experiment. Okay. After the experiment, we all reconvene at the kitchen table. And I, as the parent, call on the ego. What did you experience? Well, the ego says, I'm really shocked because I was afraid, you know, change a habit. I always equate it with some form of death, but I'm still here. I'm still here. <laughs> so uh, it wasn't so bad. It wasn't so yeah. bad. Uh, that's great. So thank you very much. How about you, Senses? What, what, what did you experience? Well, you know, I like apple pie a lot, but after we brushed the teeth, when the tongue glided, when the tongue glided over my teeth, I didn't feel that mossy feeling on my teeth. Oh, I hate that. And I like the cleanness of the teeth now when the tongue glides over it. So that was pretty good. So yeah, it was pretty, it was okay. It was okay. Well, thank you. And unconscious mind, what did you experience? Wasn't so bad. Wasn't so bad. Wasn't so bad. So, so what have I done? I have just created a pleasant experience for my ego, for my senses, for my unconscious mind and me. Mm -hmm. And now they trust me more than they did before. They trust the conscience more than they did before. Now I have established a beachhead for coordinating the ego senses and unconscious mind for another experiment at a different time so that we can all experience something pleasurable and in the in the meantime what's happening is 
the limited perspective of the ego senses and unconscious mind is expanding. Before it thought, no, don't brush the teeth. But now, maybe, maybe. So you're building new habits. New habits. We're re-engineering yeah. the software of the mind. Yeah, and that's the that's the. I have a question, but I'm going to ask it another time about the way that the wiring happens, and then through neuroplasticity, being able to rewire. And this is a this is a great thing to do. You can, re you can reconstruct both the hardware and the software. Yeah, yeah. So while you were talking, I, I was thinking, man, this is such a cool thing to do. A really neat exercise because now you're you're isolating each one of the the characters inside of you that's probably sabotaging you at some point in your day if not your hour or minute but what about what about i mean brushing your teeth is a very s simple example but what about things that are that are scary but that you really should push yourself through so for instance um I have a friend who uh, his wife went into labor, he went into the delivery room and every bit, every fiber of his being was like, I cannot watch this. I cannot go through this and removed himself from the room. And uh, there's a, a challenge in the relationship now because the wife doesn't feel, uh, doesn't feel supported, especially from that time in their lives together and he tells this story so he, he 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 tells this story publicly so i'm not saying anything out of turn or, or without him knowing but what do you do in a situation like that where you're it's fast and it's got to happen you really should be pushing yourself through it to be in that experience i'm not talking about like a a bad experience where someone's coming at you with a gun or something i'm talking about an experience like that's very taxing on the entire psyche and nervous system and everything can you go through something like this at the same time? Yes and no. It depends on desire. It depends on, everything yeah, yeah. depends on desire. Uh, desire is neither yeah. good nor bad. It's just the fuel for action. The highest principle of all of life requires that we don't take on too much too soon. You use the expression push through it. So when you're dealing with... Uh, like a PTSD syndrome that the ego senses and unconscious mind are dealing with, uh, you want to not take on too much too soon. If, if I never lifted weights in my life and I feel at this age that I need to do, uh, uh, build up my muscles, the last thing that I would want to do is go to the gym and lift 200 pounds because it would hurt me. But if I really had the desire to build muscles, I would start with just a, a small, modest amount of weight. And I would do it regularly. And after a week, I would add a couple of pounds. And after a couple of weeks, I'd add a little more. Within a month or two, I'll be lifting some substantial weight, building muscles, and I won't injure myself. So that's one thing. And then I'm ready for these more emotional types of relationships where my triggers are very powerful and my mind is, is used to being hijacked. That having been said, there are other tools that can help us. Chief among them is a mantra, is a mantra. A mantra is a word or a series of words contained in every single spiritual and religious tradition. And it, and it, shares three things in common. Every time you listen to a mantra, which is a perfect harmonic, three things happen. It generates love and fearlessness and strength. Love and fearlessness and strength. And so that when you sacrifice the fear and use the mantra as a default thought, two things are happening. Every time you listen to the mantra, you're gaining love and fearlessness and strength, which is being stored in the unconscious mind that you can draw on. But when you're aware of fear, 
that conflicts with your super conscious wisdom and you sacrifice it back to the origin from which it came. What is the origin from which it came? It's the same origin everything comes from. You know, G-O-D. Mm -hmm. So when you can offer the fear back, the debilitating and contractive power and energy of fear is automatically transformed into a strategic reserve of expansive healing energy, willpower, and creativity. So there's a, so there's a marvelous story in the ancient literature of the Bible, the ancient Torah, where young David, the shepherd boy, is walking through the valley of the shadow of death, going to fight Goliath. And he, and he yeah. knows that everybody who has fought Goliath is now dead. <laughs> so, don't you think that he's aware of fear? You bet. He was bombarded yeah, by course. fear. He was bombarded by fear. He was bombarded by fear. But, but he had a... But he stopped. It says this in the scriptures. He stops yeah. along the trail and picks up five smooth stones. What are these five smooth stones? They are the five words of his mantra that generates oh. love and fearlessness and strength. So, as young David is walking through the valley of the shadow of death, bombarded by fear... He picks up the five smooth stones of the five words of his mantra and he listens and he listens and he listens to it as his default thought, generating love and fearlessness and strength. And when the, when the emotions of fear come, he honors them, he witnesses them, he offers them back to the supreme intelligence. They are transformed because energy can be transformed into strategic reserves of energy, willpower, and creativity. The whole journey, during the whole journey, young David is increasing his love, fearlessness, and strength, his energy, willpower, and creativity. So when he finally comes face to face to Goliath, he's got everything he needs for a successful relationship. That's really interesting. I, I was listening to a book yesterday and gave that story as an example for for something uh it was actually confidence and uh it said that he had refused armor he did he had never battled with armor he had never done anything with armor so he said i, I don't need it because i know my focus my strength in this thing and i don't need armor for it so but you throw this element in there that i've never heard of before the five stones of all i've heard of but i've never heard of them as his mantra that's so neat. And then it makes me want to dig in deeper to passages of the Bible that are that have the a meaning beyond the words, really beyond the words, not, not like basic, but like really deep. That's well, what about what about Jesus himself? Yeah. What about Jesus himself, who says something to the effect that if you bring forth that which is within you, that which is within you will save you. But if you do not bring forth that which is within you, that which is within you will destroy you. He's talking about the wisdom, the super conscious wisdom of the conscience. Now, is are they are are Jesus and um, Buddha and Muhammad are these the the guys that were just so heavily ascended? And so clear on the consciousness, kind of like the Paul McCartney thing. And I'm not comparing Paul McCartney to Jesus, but I'm saying if Paul McCartney got even clearer and even clearer and even clearer, this is when miracles happen and weightlessness happens and, and that kind of thing. Is that what we're talking about here? It's just an absolute focus without any allowance of distraction from the outside, but just the internal world is so like clear and, uh, and I don't know, right word, maybe on, on course, on path, focus, that anything can literally be possible from the body, in the mind? Yeah. Anything is literally possible. Anything is literally possible. Anything is literally possible. But 
We have no claim to the outcome. We have no claim to the outcome. We are in service to the superconscious wisdom. We are an instrument. Our job is to hollow ourselves out so that the melody of the supreme intelligence can play through us. Mm -hmm. So I don't desire anything. I simply seek to be in service. That's what I'm doing right now. Yeah. I'm just planting seeds. I, I really, I don't want anybody to believe a word I'm saying. Yeah, I want them to uh, wear one of the hats that say uh, uh, <laughs> Doubting Thomas on it. Yeah. Yeah, be a good scientist. All good scientists yeah. are Doubting Thomases. But, I'm, but I, will also, I will also say that I will support you 100% if what you hear today yeah. is inspiring you to experiment within the constellation of your own relationships, turn your entire mind body sense complex into a laboratory and test what you heard. Then and only then will you find the truth. And that's the truth wow. that will set you free. Why don't more people do this then? Why are why are why is the majority of the population? I mean, we, we see. I bring this example up all the time. Is you know, I don't watch the news, but uh, on a couple of occasions, I may be in, at the gym and I saw you know during the election last year some things on the news. It's I don't want to say horrifying, but it's um, it's just really sad to see. Yeah, it's just really yeah, it's really sad to see that so many people in power are running the opposite of what you're describing here. They're running with the three amigos only. And they're not, a, they could care less about the fourth. They could care less about the conscience at all. And it's clearly evident because you're watching it on television. You're seeing it in the news. And like, why did not, why did more people not want to take this, uh, chance, do this work, dig into themselves a little, understand a little bit more about themselves and the makeup of the body and the wiring of the brain and the heart and the gut and all that. Why, why do more people not want to do this? Or why do they not do this? Well, because they want to do something else. Fair, fair answer. Fair answer. So, you know, God, whatever that means to you, has three characteristics omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. So it is the nature of the supreme intelligence, it is the nature of God to experience the infinite number of possibilities. It's the nature of God to experience, and God is consciousness. It's the it's the nature of God to experience the infinite number of possibilities. And how can this supreme intelligence, this supreme perfection, experience the infinite number of possibilities? The only way is to willingly take on ignorance. Willingly take on ignorance. <laughs> and through the human being, we're talking about the limited perspectives of the ego, senses, and unconscious mind. Yeah. So if you desire to be free of that pain, and that becomes important to you, then you'll give that your attention, and you'll work at it. And you'll work at it in every relationship to base your outer action on your inner wisdom. On the other hand, if you have a mind that is based on a sense of lack, like a person like Bernie Madoff, if you remember the Bernie Madoff story, this fellow who was born at, into poverty on the Lower East Side of New York, who became a multi-billionaire, but he never had enough money yeah. because he always defined himself by his sense of lack mm. as a little kid mm. growing up as a poor child in New York. 
So there wasn't enough money for a Bernie Madoff. You see? So it ultimately killed him. Yeah. Yeah, and he lived a life of in constant hell, literally until the day he died. Yes, right. Yeah. Yes, Even right. though I think people look and they go, well, and, and myself included, I used to look at people with a lot of money and think, well, you're free. At that it's point. not the money. It's not the money. It's, it's not the money. There's nothing wrong with money. It's the attachment. Yeah. It's the attachment. Yeah. It's always the attachment. Yeah. It's not the stuff. It's not the stuff. Where does, I have so many questions for you. Where does language play in all this? I, I've studied language and, and you mentioned earlier, we're the only species that does this because we, we are the only ones with language. So I want to know your thoughts on language and how it affects or doesn't affect all the stuff that we're talking about today. Okay. Well, that's a, that's a fabulous, fabulous question. Cool. Fabulous question. So let's, let's do an experiment. Okay. Right? Okay. Let's do an experiment because we're into experiments. Okay? So let's talk about language. So I want you to do something for me. And and uh, your listeners too. Anybody who can hear this. Mm -hmm. What I want you to do, I'm going to give you a word yep. from the language. In English language. And I want you to bring that word into your heart center. And just listen to it over and over again. Okay? And as you do... I want you to examine the nature of that word. All right? Yep. Okay. If you're, if you're comfortable, you can close your eyes. Just bring this word into your heart center. Problem. Problem. Just repeat that silently to yourself. Problem. Problem. I have a problem. And just be with that. I have a problem. And examine the weight of that word and what it does to you. Okay, now switch. Let me give you a different word. Bring this word in. Situation. 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 I have a situation. 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 Notice the weight of that word. Yeah, much less. What's the difference? The problem started, the, the problem word brought up a, a stop all. Let's fix the problem. <laughs> the situation word brought up a, okay, this is just another checkbox on all the things that I need to take care of or I'd like to take care of today. Just another situation I need to deal with today. It's cool. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So I have no more problems. I have situations. Yeah. And so I watch the words in the language of my mother tongue, English, and I set them aside and I use a synonym that is more positive, that allows me to be more creative. Because what I'm doing is when I, when I tell myself I have a problem, I'm locked down. All my creative forces or close the door. Yeah. With situation, you know, it might be some work, but I'm up for it. Yeah, totally. Totally. It's a great experiment. Mm -hmm. Any other experiments that the audience can try? Maybe something more challenging? <laughs> you, think, <laughs> you don't think that's challenging? No, the this, point audience is, is, this audience is advanced. They're evolved guys and they want more. They want more. Well, you know, the truth is that our perceptions are skewed by our conceptions. Our perceptions are skewed by our conceptions. So we see what we know. That's why uh, 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 Shakespeare says there's nothing either good or bad. Only thinking makes it so. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So I know that uh, baseball is a great uh, teacher. And I love baseball. Uh, and there were three umpires having dinner together, baseball umpires, and they were talking shop. And what were they talking about? They were talking and discussing what constitutes a ball and what constitutes a strike. So the first umpire, who is a rookie, says, 
I call them as I see them. Okay. The second umpire is calling balls and strikes for about 10 years. And he says, I call them as they are. Okay. He calls them as they are. Then the third umpire is an old pro. He's been calling balls and strikes for about 25 years. He looks at the other two, shaking his head, and he says, finally, they are what I call them. <laughs> <laughs> our perceptions are skewed by our conceptions. Yeah. So if we change our perspective, we change our experience. If we change our perspective, we change our experience. I can look at the same issue that I look at every day, but if I can change it to a higher perspective, so to speak, if I can look at that situation from the far side of the moon, I'll perceive something differently. Yeah. And that's my job, to look at the higher perspective. And the conscience provides the higher perspective. It's from outside the matrix. It's from outside this mind-body-sense complex. It's from outside these, these limitations of religions and, and race and age and gender, you see, and politics. It's beyond all that. Yeah. It's simply the wisdom that we need to know what's to be thought what's to be spoken and what's to be done in a way that will lead me to fulfill the purpose of life without pain, misery, or bondage. Yeah. So in essence, the challenge or the problem uh, versus situation example uh -huh. is, as, is as challenging as you want it to be because for some people that might be, it might be almost impossible according to them. That's right. Yeah. Okay. That's Fair. Right. I like that. I, I like that a lot. What does karma fit in in all this stuff? Well, there's what the law of karma. Karma, karma. karma means action. And every relationship, every relationship that we have is the consequence of a previous action that we have taken. Providing us the perfect opportunity to self-examine and let go of some obstacle in my unconscious mind that is inhibiting the light of love that is within me, that is me. Mm -hmm. Got it. So there are no accidents. Every relationship has a purpose. Yeah. It's up to me to find out what the purpose is. Learn from it. And give the best of what I have to offer that I receive from the superconscious portion of the mind through the conscience to whatever the relationship is in which I find myself. Such a great, such a great explanation. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure my team isolates that and puts it out just as a little clip. It's such a great explanation. There are no accidents. Every relationship has its purpose. And again, going back to what we talked about in the beginning, it's our job to remove the distractions so we can see that clearly and just keep moving That's right. forward. That's great. That's, That's our great. job. Simple That's enough, job. right? That's Super right. simple. Yes. That's right. Well, it's got to be simple. It's got to yeah. be easy. Totally. You know, it's got to be for the least common denominator. It, for, for those guys that are listening, or women, more women listen to this podcast than men, actually. For those people that are listening... I know we talked about God earlier, and I, and I want to just talk to that one person that, that is either saying, I believe too much in God and God's ability to guide, or the guy who's saying, I don't believe in God. Does, does this all work for me if I don't believe that? Can you just kind of explain that? <clears throat> well... For example, if you're an athe atheist, nobody's asking you to believe in God. Only believe in yourself. And if you believe in yourself, yourself 
at the core of yourself is this intuitive library of wisdom that's reflected by the conscience in the form of superconscious wisdom. So you can be an atheist and still follow this. If you're a Christian and you let the conscience be your guide, then you'll be a better Christian. If you're a Jew, you'll be a better Jew. If you're a Buddhist, you'll be a better Buddhist. If you're yeah. a Muslim, you'll be a better Muslim. That's the There's answer. no conflict. There's no conflict. Yeah. No, yeah, that's the answer. I mean, it can be as simple as possible, but that's, or as complicated as possible, but that's that's a simplistic answer, and it works. And really and works. and it, it bears uh, stating now that the Buddha, the Buddha, that uh, that Buddhism uh, uses as a great teacher, and he is. The word Buddha comes from the Sanskrit buddhi comes from the Sanskrit buddhi. That's why he was called the Buddha, because he used his buddhi. And do you know what buddhi is? It's the conscience. Interesting. All right. Well, it's been a real treat. And yeah, honestly, me too. A real treat. I, I really, um, I, I love learning about the deeper ways that we can help ourselves and course correct ourselves and subsequently help other people. So this is always, it's always exciting for me to get on with somebody like you who has just a really deep intimate knowledge and, uh, and learn. And I know the audience will benefit too. And some of these concepts are going to be beyond people and that's fine. But what we're telling them is there's something to look forward to. There's something beyond the control mechanisms that you put in place. There's something inside of you that's way more powerful than you think it is. And that's awesome. That's really awesome to know. And I, lo I love what you're doing. Where can people find out more about you, your teachings, that kind of thing? Okay. Uh, we have two websites. One is for the book, Your Conscience, and it's at yourconscience.org. Yourconscience.org. Then it'll tell you about the book, Your Conscience, tell you a little bit about me, and it will give you uh, an understanding of where you can buy uh, the book, which is basically everywhere. Uh, yeah. and, uh, I founded the American Meditation Institute uh, in 1996. That's where I teach. And uh, the American Meditation Institute has a website, AmericanMeditation.org. AmericanMeditation.org. And on the homepage, there is a link on the homepage about halfway down for Sunday meditation. Every Sunday from 11 in 11, excuse me, from 9:30 in the morning till 11 o'clock, 9:30 to 11 Eastern Time (AM), I lead a guided meditation and a philosophical conversation, just like you, Ian, and I have uh, just concluded. Beautiful. So that's a free link. And you'll get a recording that you can use and keep. Uh, so I would invite people to take advantage of that if you're interested. Oh, one more thing. How does someone find their mantra? I've always been curious. Every, every religious tradition has mantras. Okay. Uh, I have uh, printed mantras for people uh, in my first book. The Heart and Science of Yoga. Uh, but if people want to contact me, they can contact me at the American Meditation Institute and I can discuss that with them. I Got can it. discuss that with you again, uh, Ian, uh, sure. uh, at another time. And, and, or we can do a whole no show on, uh, on meditation <laughs> mantras. Yeah, I love that. I love, I, I love, this stuff is just, it's, it puts everything within your reach. That's all right. possibilities, that's all right. possibilities. That's what, that's what I love. That's what I love about it. Yeah, it's exciting. So, Leonard, thank you so much for being here. It's been a real treat, yes. a real eye opener, and um, love the. I just love the love the knowledge that you have. So, thanks for sharing it with our audience, with me, and um, 
yeah, I think we should definitely plan on having you back on to discuss some deeper concepts of, of some of the things we talked about today. An hour is not that long to talk about some of these concepts and to try and squeeze a bunch of things in. So, um, yeah, audience, we're going to we're going to do we're going to we'll set it up again. We'll get you on in a couple months and we'll, we'll go deeper into some of the concepts. I'll get some audience feedback and we'll go from there. Great. So on our website, AmericanMeditation.org, you'll yep. find our email and it goes directly to me. Perfect. Love it. And I'll put that in the show notes as well for the audience. Okay, good deal. Awesome. Leonard, thank you so much for being here. Hey, thank you. God bless you. Absolutely. Audience, thanks for listening. We'll catch you on the next one.